It is my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Joe Allen, our campus pastor at Dallas Theological Seminary. Pastor Joe earned his Master of Theology degree from DTS in 1988 and his Doctor of Ministry degree from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in 1994. He has pastored for over 30 years, mainly in Georgia, his home state. Lindsay, his high school sweetheart, and Joe celebrated 44 years of marriage this past June. And we are thankful to have Lindsay with us today, indeed. The Allens have two married children who both serve in vocational Christian ministry and three grandchildren, one of whom, if you do not know the story, they're all miracles, right? Grandchildren always are, and blessings from the Lord. But one in particular is a very interesting miracle. Miracle. You need to ask Joe about that sometime. So they have three grandchildren. Joe serves as our campus pastor here at DTS. And during his downtime, he enjoys playing with the grandkids and watching University of Texas football. <laughs> Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Joe Allen today? <laughs> you can get me later for that. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Yarborough. Thank you. Go dogs. <laughs> Take your Bibles open, if you would, to the book of James. And uh, the music was great today, Patrick. Thank you, and thank you, band, and Christy for singing that first one. Yeah, we have a grandson. Uh, he's a year and a half. Lindsay flies out tomorrow to see him. She has flown more during COVID than she has the whole rest of her life put together. She is burning up the airways going back and forth to South Florida to see our one and a half year old grandson whose egg was frozen for 12 years. It's just amazing what they can do these days. And that's uh, because my daughter had a couple of bouts with cancer and had enough since to have her eggs harvested and frozen because she wasn't even married at the time. Anyway, I better stop there or the sermon will be about little Tuffy Tommy. But uh, let me uh, get us rolling here by telling you that my best friend all the way through high school was a guy named Howard Friedberg. Yes, Friedberg. His mama worked at the synagogue in Atlanta and uh, Howard was a dear friend. Uh, I've had Passover with the Friedbergs. Howard was such an interesting character. He was all county, all region, honorable mention, all state in football. He was the valedictorian of our class. He won the Atlanta Journal Cup for having the highest GPA and being a two sport letterman. Howard was an amazing guy. But the truly amazing fact was that none of this rubbed off on me. Uh, I remember one day, uh, one evening, one Friday night after a football game, uh, Howard and I and everybody else, we were showering and getting in our street clothes after we'd uh, been defeated again. I think in the whole uh, course of my four or five years on the football team, we won three games maybe? I mean, we were everybody's whipping boy. At, at, at any rate, um, we were getting dressed and somebody told a Jew joke. And the, the problem was that it was really funny. And so we were all laughing and I happened to notice that Howard wasn't laughing. As a matter of fact, Howard was very upset. And um, I, I, I said something, I, I, just being ignorant. I said something, I said, come on, Howard. I said, they were just joking and I'll never forget his response as long as I live. He looked at me and with all seriousness, he said, easy for you to say. I've been putting up with that my whole life. You know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm slow, but I'm not that slow. We have people in this room who have put up with stuff like that their whole lives. And so I want to continue here and 
but I, it, it's time for me to make a quick application. For all of us, two words, be sensitive. Or how about three words? Be a little more sensitive. Well, that was four. <laughs> Seven out of six pastors can't do math. <laughs> Howard Friedberg went on to Emory University in Atlanta, and then he went to Emory University Medical School, and he is a uh, practicing ophthalmologist, as is his wife, and they live in Pennsylvania now. Uh, not too long ago, I read a book called Exploring the World of the Jew by John Phillips, and it is a fascinating read. I mean fascinating. You see, the Jews were the great traders of the ancient world, and in many ways, that world gave them every opportunity to practice their commercial abilities. It was an age of founding cities, and their founders were looking for citizens to occupy these cities. Citizenship was offered freely to the Jews because the founders had enough sense to know that where the Jews went, money and trade followed. Most of the early Christians were Jews, as I know all of you know. And so James, in this short passage, is addressing these Christian businessmen. So I want you to picture a man looking at a map. And he, he points at a certain spot on the map, and he says... Here's a new city where there are great trade opportunities. I'll go there, I'll get in on the ground floor, I'll trade for a year or so, I'll make my fortune, and I will come back rich. Now I want you to cheat ahead for just a moment and look at verse 17 because there is some debate there. There's some debate there as to how this verse fits in with the context. And uh, you're welcome to make your own choice, but I think it fits because these businessmen knew the right thing to do, but they weren't doing it. And so verse 17 says, therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. You know, for them to say, well, I'll go there, I'll get in on the ground floor, I'll trade for a year or so, I'll make my fortune and I'll come back rich. Um, they knew that wasn't right. And so James begins in a most serious tone. Uh, the New American Standard starts uh, verse 13 with come now. Uh, the ESV has it come now also. And then the NIV says now listen. It, it's, it's rather stern language which until I really began to delve into the book of James I didn't realize that. I just thought he was a mild-mannered person. But this is sort of like when, you're, when, when you got in trouble at home and your mama called you and she used your middle name. Then you knew you were in for trouble. You know, uh, uh, Joe Morris, get in here. You know, I brought you into this world. I can sure take you out. <laughs> My dad had different language. He would say, son, cut me a hickory because I'm going to tan your hide. Uh, that, that's not acceptable today, I realize, but uh, uh, unless you believe the Bible. But uh, <laughs> it, it's not the plans that went wrong. It's not that we're going to go to this or that city. That's number one. Number two, we're going to spend a year there. Number three, we're going to carry on business. Number four, we're going to make money. That wasn't exactly what was wrong. What was wrong was the exclusion of God. They had done an end run around God, a total disregard for God. I would call it practical atheism, although it's actually worse. It's idolatry. You, 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 you take that attitude and what you are doing, James is telling us, is that you are setting yourself up as God. In verse 14, look what it says. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. So verse 14 lets us know that something else is amiss here. They're not only sidestepping God in their planning, but no allowance is made for unforeseen circumstances. I mean, these guys and us, by way of application, 
were confident that they were going to be able to carry their plans through to completion. I mean, who, who among us could have foreseen 2020? Who, am I, who among us could have foreseen COVID-19 or Snowvid 21? <laughs> who could have known that? Who could have seen that? Because you don't know what the future holds. You don't know what the future, listen, you don't know what the future holds tomorrow, much less in the coming year. Can I get an amen? amen? You don't know what the future holds. You can't control the future and your very life is uncertain. James calls it a vapor here, a mist or a fog. James borrowed that figure from the book of Job where we find many pictures of the brevity of life. Listen to these. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, Job 7. The cloud is consumed and vanisheth away, Job 7. Our days upon earth are a shadow, Job 8. Now my days are swifter than a post, Job 9. They are passed away as the swift ships, as the eagle that hasteneth to the prey, Job 9. Man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down, he fleeth also as the shadow and continueth not, Job 14. <laughs> Have a blessed day. <laughs> you know, we count our years at each birthday, but God tells us to number our days in Psalm 90. We spend our lives when in actuality we ought to be investing our lives. Life is precious, transitory. It's precarious. It's insecure. It's a shadow, a cloud, a breath. Uh, uh, it's described as grass. My 10th grade biology teacher, Mrs. Isles, used to say, the death rate is one per person. Dr. John Walvert, former president of this institution, said everyone's got to graduate sometime. I used to ask my father-in-law, I called him Pop. And I'd say, hey, Pop, how you doing? And he'd respond by saying, well, I'm not buying any green bananas. You know, <laughs> you may get that tomorrow sometime. <laughs> if you do a careful study of the book of James, you'll find that it is often referred to as the Proverbs of the New Testament. And so I was thinking about that as I was preparing this message, and it occurred to me that a very, very simple couplet of verses that we all know is saying the exact same thing that James is saying. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It's the same message. It's sort of like a battery with uh, a, a negative and a positive terminal. James is stating this truth, and James states it in the negative, while Proverbs states it in the positive. You know the verses. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths or he will make your paths straight or it can be translated, he will remove obstacles. Now in Georgia, we have... Uh, uh, we have a little saying, and it can be used of a person or a path or a thing or anything. And you'll often hear people say, why, he's as crooked as a dog's hind leg. Or that path is as crooked as a dog's hind leg. And what I'm trying to say and what James is saying here is that your path will be crooked and hard if you don't trust him. If you don't trust him, when uh, we met for prayer across the hall, as we do every chapel, um, we were just kind of small talking and Dr. Yarborough said, he said it to my wife. He said, he said, you know, God has us just where he wants us, dependent. Amen. Amen. And the genius of God is that he seems to always keep us where we have to look up. Have you experienced that? 
It's, it's uncanny how he does that. The word trust in Proverbs 3, 5, the word trust means to lie helpless face down. It's the picture of a servant awaiting his master's command. It's, it's a picture of a soldier lean, uh, uh, yielding to a conquering general. That's the word trust. Trust. You, you know, I, I think it's closely connected with, uh, with worship. And I've noticed it more than ever before. When you read worship in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, there's always the element of getting low of bowing low before the Lord to worship, to trust. So we're told to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and to lean not on our own understanding, but to acknowledge him. That word acknowledge, it's not a nod of recognition. Yeah, God, I, I know you're there, big guy in the sky, which by the way, we all have our pet peeves and that's one of them for me. When somebody refers to God as the big man in the sky. Ugh. Anyway, to acknowledge is not just a nod of recognition. It means to be aware of and to have fellowship with. And when you're aware of him and you have fellowship with him, he will make a smooth path for you. He will bring you to your appointed goal. He will give you, dare I say it, success. I didn't say monetary success, but he will give you success. Do you remember what happened in Genesis chapter 12, uh, verses 10 through 20, where Abraham goes down into Egypt? He goes down into Egypt and uh, lies about his wife and says that she's his sister. Does that sound like acknowledging God and trusting him? Or what about Joshua when he attacked Ai in Joshua 7? I remember years ago, before I came to seminary, uh, too long to go into all the details here, but I was pastoring a, a little storefront church in the middle of no, Nowheresville, Kentucky. And it was already culture shock for us. Not that there's anything wrong with the way they do things in Kentucky, but it was very different from the way I had been brought up in Atlanta doing things. The people there were slaughtering hogs in their backyard. We didn't do that in Atlanta. Uh, they were anyway, you get the idea. Things were very different there, very different. And uh, we had started a church. I thought we were doing the right thing. We were trying to follow the Lord the best we could. I was married. I was very young. I think I was 24 years old and already had two kids. I got married when I was 20. Um, and we were about to starve to death. I'd never lived where it snowed so much, except for Dallas, you know. <laughs> but but we were having a really hard time and, and we were so focused and we were so committed and we were so dialed in on getting that church off the ground and we worked and we worked and we worked and we worked and we could not for the life of us get that church off the ground. We just had a handful of people meeting in a storefront that had a little section of the back of the room sectioned off for my office and that was our nursery until we got permission to go upstairs and have the nursery upstairs. And the pulpit was here and the men's bathroom, that, well, the only bathroom, the, the men and women's bathroom was right to the side of the pulpit. And I've got some stories about that that I'll <laughs> spare you. But uh, all this while, um, my youngest brother was attending First Baptist Atlanta. And little, you know, unbeknownst to me, he was talking to Dr. Stanley about me. And, um, you know, just saying, he was, he, was, he was saying, he was speaking for me when I wasn't able to speak for myself. And he was telling Dr. Stanley how I'd love to visit with him. Well, I never told him to say that, but it was true. I would love to, who wouldn't? So, um, 
it, it got to be Christmas time and we took a much needed break and we went down to Atlanta and uh, then my wife took the kids, our two small kids, and she went on down to Macon so she could be with her parents who lived there. And I stayed with my parents and my brother, my youngest brother, and we went to church on Sunday morning. It was around Christmas time. And I remember Dr. Stanley was greeting people at the front door uh, when they were leaving. He, he, was, he was really a good pastor. And uh, so we're walking out and my brother goes over, kind of fights through the crowd. The place was just lousy with people. And my brother shakes hands with Dr. Stanley and he said, Dr. Stanley, this is my brother, the one I've been telling you about. So Dr. Stanley shook hands with me and he was so gracious. That, that's one thing that really sticks out in my mind, how gracious he was. And he had a heart for young pastors, you could tell especially young pastor, the pastors that were struggling. And so my brother pipes up again. He'd really like to talk to you. He's home on vacation. And I'm, I was really embarrassed. But Dr. Stanley said this. Now think about this. He's got a church with thousands of people in it. And he looks at me and he says, if you and your brother can come over tomorrow at about 11 o'clock, we'll sit down and talk for about an hour. So we thought, wow, all right. So it was highly encouraging to me, and believe me, it was a time I needed a lot of encouragement. So we went over the next day, and we went in. We went into his house. He lived in Snellville. I remember that. And uh, we went up these long flight of stairs, it seemed like, and went into his study. And he had some chairs for us, and we sat down. And uh, he kind of cranked back in his chair and folded his arms. I, you know, it was, it, was, it was such a great pattern for how to counsel. He knew pastoral counseling. And it, he leaned back and he said, just tell me about yourself, where you're from, where you grew up. Tell me about your family, what you're doing now, how you ended up in Kentucky, how are things going? So I did. I told him everything. I thought, what do I have to lose? I told him everything. And then he, you know, he sat back. And he was, I remember he was sitting like this, and he said, um, let me ask you this. If you could do anything you wanted, no bars held. If you could do anywhere, anything you wanted, go anywhere you wanted, what would you do? And I said, I'd go to Dallas Theological Seminary so fast it would make your head swim. He sat back, he was like this. He sat up, leaned forward, and he said, I know what you ought to do. And I said, yeah. He said, you ought to go to Dallas Seminary. Without going into a lot of details, that was one of the most liberating moments of my life. There was such a freedom there was such grace washing over me, just in waves. And some of the hesitancies that I had, he answered. And it freed me. It freed me. And I remember we walked out of his house and we thanked him profusely. And my brother got in the passenger side and I got in the driver's seat of my car. And I wept and wept and wept and wept. My brother didn't, didn't say a word. He reached over and just patted me on the arm because he knew and he was leading the blocking for me in that whole thing. It was the most liberating moment I probably had in my life up until that point. And so we went, drove back home to my parents' house, and then I think that same day I drove on down to Macon, and I told Lindsay, I said, sweetheart, darling, I said, I was able to meet with Dr. Stanley, and I can tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go to Dallas Seminary. 
And she looked at me and she said, no, we're not. (laughs) Now, pastors, this is a lesson for you because what happens typically in a church is a pastor is here, the elders are here, and the congregation is here. And time has to pass when you cast a vision that the elders have to catch up and then you've got to give the congregation time to catch up. Lindsay simply hadn't caught up. We talked it through, we talked it through, we talked it through. And she said, we're still not going. And I said, yes, ma'am. No, that's not what happened. (laughs) She said, I can see the logic of it and I can see the Lord's hand in it. And as she always does, she will tell me, always, in any major decision I've ever made, she will say, if you can look me in the eyes and tell me beyond any shadow of a doubt that this is what God is leading you to do, then I am behind you 100%. Fellas, I outpunted my coverage when it came to a wife. And then we did, we came to Dallas Seminary. We're the only couple in the history of the school that took a step up financially when we came here. (laughs) I tell you, you, I would like to stand before you and say, you know, I was trusting the Lord with all my heart. The truth of the matter is I was scared to death. I had two kids and a wife that were completely dependent upon me. And uh, I was, as we say in Georgia, I was running scared. I was running scared. But you know what? It was trust. I felt like Peter. I I felt like Peter when the Lord said, are are you going to desert me also, Peter? And Peter said, Lord, where do we go? You're the one who has the words of eternal life. Where else can I go? I had a guy ask me when I was a student here, what are you going to do if you don't pastor? And I said, I don't have a plan B. Lindsay's mother asked me that before we got married. What are you going to do if you don't get a call to a church? I said, I don't have a plan B. And I think that's what God is looking for. And I didn't realize it at the time, but he honored it. And he made our path straight. And I was able to come here to an institution that profoundly impacted my life profoundly impacted my life. I was just running scared. Look at verse 15. Instead, what you ought to say, James is informing us, is if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. Now that's not some formula that we repeat as a mantra, but it definitely should be our attitude. Paul said it on a few occasions, but he always, always conditioned his plans on what the Lord's will was. Even Jesus said, now get this, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. The point of the passage is that self-sufficiency and independence from God is aggressively and viciously wicked. I'm going to give you a paraphrase for verse 16. Listen to this as you look at the verse. In point of fact, you boast in your arrogance and it's empty boasting. You make extravagant claims you can't fulfill regarding the knowledge and control of the future. James seems to be saying, you arrogant and boastful so-and-so. You're like a wandering quack peddling snake oil, offering cures that are not actually cures, boasting you can do things that you can't do. Your mouth has written a check and your body can't cash it. You don't know, nor can you know the future. You're not in control. You're not in the driver's seat. When I was a little boy, I saw a bumper sticker. And even as a lost little boy, I knew something wasn't right. Maybe you've seen this bumper sticker. God is my co-pilot. 
And I used to think, God is my co-pilot. God isn't your co-pilot. God is the pilot. He owns the plane. He owns the air. He's the one in control. He, you get the point. You get the point. The uncertainty of life is the reason for complete dependence on God. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. So, speaking of co-pilots, as I approach the runway, we are to commit to the future and all of our plans and all of our years and all of our months and all of our weeks and all of our days and all of our hours and all of our moments and our deeds and our thoughts and our plans and our feelings and our money, everything into the hand of God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all, all of your heart. Speaking of Dr. Charles Stanley, you know, he spoke here a couple of years ago, two or maybe three years ago. And he told a story that is probably the best illustration I've ever heard of this. He spoke on this passage. And one of the stories he told was that when he first came to First Baptist Atlanta, he didn't come as a pastor. He came as the associate pastor. The pastor was a liberal, a flaming liberal. And uh, because of that, everything throughout the church was infected. And he said he was attending a meeting. I wonder if any of you remember this. He was attending a meeting, uh, and, and he said the committee had a judge on it who was the chairman, three attorneys, and two or three other people on this particular committee, and they were hem-hawing around. They needed to make some sort of a decision, but they couldn't come to a conclusion. They couldn't make the decision. He was in the meeting just observing. He had no authority. No one hardly knew who he was. He was just sort of on the side. I almost picture it as him stepping out of the shadows, and he spoke up. And he said, well, you know, we could pray about it. And the judge who was the chairman looked at him and said, leave God out of this. This is business. Is that not exactly what James is saying? You've left God out of this. You're carrying on business without acknowledging him, without trusting him. So verse 17 is essentially saying you've been warned. You, you have no excuse. That, 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 sounds, that, that sounds almost like a threat. I mean, it's certainly a solemn admonition. You have no excuse. The truth has been placed before your eyes. So to continue now to live your life as if it was yours when you've been reminded that the future is in God's hands is sin. Is sin. So do the right thing. Cast yourself in complete dependence on the Lord. Evidenced by your attitude. If the Lord wills. If the Lord wills. My wife has a saying. She says, uh, if the Lord wills and the saints don't rise. <laughs> Warren Wearsby tells a great story. He says a perplexed teenager, uh, a boy, told him at a church youth conference, I would give my life to the Lord, but I'm afraid. And Warren Wearsby asked him, he said, what are you afraid of? And the boy said, well, I'm afraid God will ask me to do something dangerous. I love what Wearsby responded. The dangerous life is not in the will of God, but out of the will of God. The safest place in the world is right where God wants you. So let me land the plane. You can spend your life any way you like. 
but you can only spend it once. Maybe different if we had two lives or three lives. <laughs> we have one life. So trust him. Depend on him. Acknowledge him. Let your attitude be if the Lord wills. And the upside of all of this is he will give you success. Not necessarily financial success, but he will give you spiritual success. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you, all of us, every one of us that knows you as Savior, that knows the Lord Jesus Savior and our Father as our Father. Every one of us that has the Holy Spirit living inside of us, we thank you and we love you. And we love you because you first loved us and died for us. And may we never, never get over the fact that you took away our sins so that we could live with you forever in heaven. You came back from the dead to prove it. Thank you, Lord. And as Spurgeon said, the smallest amount of faith will take your soul to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven down to your soul. So we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.